dog guy. I tried to get him to tell me what he was going to talk about, and he wouldn't. <laughs> so I'll let him explain. Okay. Well, thank you very much to the organizers. That's really great to be here. Um, the conference has been great so far. So, sorry. Um, okay, so system notation, just to set up. So SGP will be PSG surface. P puncture is orientable. Always orientable for this clock. Um, so we've already seen the curve graph come up a few times this week, but I'll just redefine it just in case um, people weren't here or they forget. So, uh, and I'm going to stick with the, I think I already said graph. So everything I'm going to be doing with graphs, I'm not going to talk about complexes uh, for now. It'll be simpler. So the curve graph is a graph. And the vertices are isotopy classes of essential simple closed curves on your surface. And edges are just disjointness. So you connect two of these vertices by an edge if say their geometric intersection number is zero. They have they admit disjoint representatives. Um, so there's an endless number of really interesting properties that this graph has that I could mention, which I won't, um, for now at least. So um, I think for right now, all I want to do is mention two properties that have also already been mentioned this week. So the first is um, one of the major theorems that kicked off a lot of the study of the coarse geometry of this space, which is that it's delta hyperbolic. So um, as a metric space, so, so C of S uh, is delta hyperbolic uh, for some delta. So that is, it satisfies this you know, delta slim triangles condition. And the other theorem I want to mention, um, which might come up and it might not, I'm not totally sure yet, but we'll see, is so, so every Gromov hyperbolic metric space has a Gromov boundary, um, which Loosely speaking, what is it? So you pick any base point in your space, and you consider equivalence classes of geodesic rays emanating from that base point, where you consider two rays to be the same if they remain within a bounded distance of each other throughout all time. So I'm being a little vague, but I, don't, I only want to give an idea, so just <coughs> So the theorem I want to mention is to Clarike, which says that the boundary the Gromov boundary of the curve complex can be identified with the space of ending laminations on the surface. So what is that? Wow. I've never drawn the script E right twice in a row. That's good. <laughs> um, so this, these are laminations on your surface that are both filling and minimal. So what do these words mean? Minimal just means uh, every leaf is dense. Every leaf is dense in lambda. And filling means that every complementary region is simply connected. So complementary regions are simply connected. Okay? So um, great. So what is the sort of 30 second goal of this talk. Well, the first goal is to convince you, if you don't already know, that the curve complex and its friends are really, uh, they play really integral roles in determining the geometry and topology of hyperbolic three manifolds. Um, so there are lots of really um, great theorems, culminations of many people's work over the last, I guess, 20 years. Um, and I'll mention a couple of them along the way. Um, but one issue with them is that they tend to not be very constructive or effective. So if you would like to use one of these theorems, suppose that you happen to know something about the curve graph for a particular example, and you want to apply one of these theorems that says, well, you know, the curve graph can tell you x, y, z about your hyperbolic three manifold. It's not so easy to actually apply it because there are these constants that pop up in all these theorems that depend on very mysterious ways on like the topology of the surface and maybe they grow horribly as the genus increases, maybe they're uniform and it's not so clear. 
Um, so like in light of say for instance um, you know the, the new proof of virtual fibering um, you know maybe maybe really the, the curve graph is saying a lot about hyperbolic three manifolds since every closed one has a finite cheated cover which fibers over the circle so there is a lot of surface topology at play but you know you might have to take you know uh, degree three trillion cover and then you have no control over the genus of the fiber and so it'd be nice if we could say something about how these theorems change as we change the genus. Um, so, okay, let me mention some of those theorems now that I'm talking about, so it's a little bit less cry cryptic. Um, the first, there's going to be a sequence of, I guess, three theorems I want to write down. Um, I'm going to erase this. So, at least for the first two, I'm going to fix some surface closed, just because it'll make the statements easier to say, so no punctures. Genus at least two, and so let's all write that. So S genus at least two um, and closed. So here's the first theorem I want to mention, and this is actually, I guess, originally due to Minsky, but it follows from lots of other things that are already out there. Um, let's see. So Minsky, um, it also follows from work of Brock Bromberg, and also. Uh, Brock, Canary, Minsky. Um, so this says that suppose I take, I want to make sure I state it the right way. So there exists, I should have said something else before I started writing this theorem down, which is, um, so I want to take some pseudo Anasov mapping class. Okay, so I have this mapping class group, and I pick, I pick some psi, which is a pseudo Anasov. And I want to look at this theorem and the other two that I'm going to state afterwards. It's going to concern the mapping torus that I get by just, so I'll call it M psi, and this is just the manifold S cross 0, 1, quotient out by S, sorry, X 0 is the same as psi of X 1. Okay? And here with Thurston is that there's always, this manifold always admits a complete hyperbolic metric. So I want to consider this manifold in that metric, and now I can state the theorem. So there exists some constant, which I'll call k1, and k1 depends on two things. It depends on the surface, so like the Euler characteristic of the surface. It also depends on the injectivity radius of this manifold m psi. Okay, so everything is closed. So you can just think of this injectivity rate. It's just the one half the length of the shortest closed geodesic. Okay? Um, such that the following inequality holds. Um, K1 times, I'll say what these things are, tau C of psi plus K1 is less than or equal to what I'm going to call the circumference of this manifold M psi which is less than or equal to, again, k1, sorry, this is wrong. This should be divided by k1, this should be minus k1, it's a lower bound, and this should be what I wrote there, which is tau psi plus k1. So this just says that these two quantities, whatever they are, I haven't told you what they are, are coarsely the same up to an additive and multiplicative error bounded by this <coughs> minus k1. So what are these things? So tau sub c of psi is just the translation length of this mapping class acting on the curve graph. So that's just the minimum distance that psi moves any given vertex of the curve graph. So to write it down, it's just what I said, the minimum over all vertices of the curve graph, the distance between itself and its image under psi. Okay? And what is this circumference of m sub psi? So that's the length of the shortest arc in the hyperbolic metric of this mapping torus that traverses the circle direction. So you start at some fixed fiber, and you consider arcs which leave that fiber, go around the circle, and come back to the same fiber, and you minimize the length over all such arcs. That's the circumference of M psi. Okay? But they don't have to close up, right? They can have different endpoints. Yes, yes, they don't have to close up. Thank you. So length of shortest. Full slip, short slip fiber? Doesn't matter. Uh, traversing 
the S1 direction. Okay? So this is great. It's telling us that this completely geometric property of this manifold is somewhat determined just by looking at the action of the monodromy on this curve graph. Okay? Um, so that's, that's the first sort of theorem of the state. Um, and the next two theorems are going to be of the same flavor, but for friends of the curve graph, not, not, not the curve graph itself. Um, it's like it's all race this. So the pants graph is a graph where the vertices are pants decompositions P on some surface, and the edges correspond to two such decompositions where they share all but one curve in common. And you can get from one to the other by replacing that one curve with one that intersects at minimal possible. So I'll write that down. So um, P1 is obtained from P2 by um, replacing one curve C by C prime, and C prime intersects C minimal possible amongst all choices of curves I could have replaced C with that will still make me have a pants decomposition. Okay? So this minimal number possible is always either one or two, depending on whether the complementary region you get by deleting this curve is a one function torus or a formal scheme. Okay? Um, so the next theorem. Same exact assumptions on psi. It's a pseudo Nossoff mapping class. I'm going to be looking at this manifold M sub psi. This mapping torus G is still going to be a genus at least two surface closed due to Brock. And this is his mapping torus theorem, which tells you that there exists some constant. This time, it only depends on the surface and not anything else with the manifold, not, not the injectivity radius. Um, K2, depending only on S, such that the translation length in the pants graph of psi divided by k2 minus k2 is less than or equal to the volume of this manifold, which is less than or equal to k2 times tau p psi plus k2. Okay? So if you want to know about the volume of your mapping torus, you should look at the action of the monodromy in the pants graph, not the curve graph. Okay? And for slightly annoying and technical reasons that I won't get into, it'll be easier to actually state this theorem using um, asymptotic or stable translation length. It's still true. You might have to change the K2 a little bit, but it doesn't matter. So asymptotic, stable translation length. You take any vertex in your pants graph, and you look at the limit tau p psi equals the limit as n goes to infinity of the distance in the pants graph between any pants decomposition and its image under side of the n, and you divide this by n. Okay? So that's the asymptotic translation. Okay? Great. Um, so there's one more theorem I want to state of this flavor, and it involves the arc graph. So we have you've seen the curve graph, we've seen the pants graph, and the arc graph also has to play play along. Um, this is a good question. Is yes. That, is that necessarily finite? That um, well, maybe not. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is finite because it's 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 bounded above by just the translation length. Okay. Right. So um, it is finite, and it doesn't depend on the choice of base point. And it's always bigger than zero for pseudo analysis Also. Okay. Um, okay. So if I want to have a theorem like this for the arc graph. I have to, of course, start to allow punctures. So let's just assume, to make things as simple as possible, that I have exactly one puncture, okay? Even though this theorem will hold with many punctures. So, um, but, so one puncture, it'll just make my statement easier. Um, and this is recent, this next theorem, and it's due to Dave Fooder and Art Schleimer, not Schleimer, Saul Schleimer. <laughs> So when you say arc, you, it means arcs and curves or just arcs? Arcs. So I'll say that, I'll say that in a second. So Kutcher, Schleimer, and this is very recent, I guess it's like 2012. Um, so yeah, so 
the arc graph of a surface with punctures, the vertices are um, isotopic classes of properly embedded essential arcs. And again, edges are disjointness. Okay? So if I have one puncture in my mapping in, in, in my surface, when I form this mapping torus, I'm gonna get some cusp, right? The cusp is homeomorphic to torus cross some interval, right? And it if I lift up to the universal cover, it just comes from the action of a Z cross Z group of deck transformations acting on some pore ball in hyperbolic three space, right? So um, there's a maximal cusp neighborhood, which is what I get by taking one of these lifts of this cusp up to a horror ball, and then I, I look at all the possible lifts of these horror balls. There's infinitely many of these horror balls in H3, and I start expanding them until eventually you, they start to touch. And when they touch, that's called, take any one of those horror balls, and that's called a maximal cusp neighborhood. Okay? And it's bounded by some Euclidean torus, and I can ask about what the area of that torus is. Okay? It's a totally geometric property of this three manifold that actually tells you a lot about like, the kinds of Dane fillings you can do um, on this torus boundary component. Okay? So um, they say that the following holds. I need to see the notes. So the asymptotic translation length in the arc graph of psi divided by 450 times the Euler characteristic to the fourth power <laughs> is less than the area of this maximal cusp boundary, this torus maximal cusp boundary, which is, in turn is less than or equal to 9 times the Euler characteristic of your surface squared times, again, this tau a psi bar, okay? Is that a strict inequality on the left? That's a strict inequality. Um, I don't know if it has to be. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Anyway, but that's, that's, that's what, what they prove. Um, yeah, in other words, it may just be that they don't, they don't know that it's, it's, it's possible to, to achieve some kind of equality. It doesn't mean that, that it has to be strict. Okay, so what's the difference between this theorem and the other two? It's that we actually have some sort of effective control on how the multiplicative and additive errors in this relationship depend on the complexity of the surface. So um, where does it come from? Well, so having the presence of a puncture actually makes things a lot simpler. So if there's one thing we've learned in the last, I don't know, five years talking about these complexes, like arcs are easier. Um, and and, and they, they utilize that a lot. And, and actually, um, their, their proof is pretty elementary in hyperbolic geometry. It's actually a really nice paper. Um, but um, the goal would be to try and understand the growth of the errors in those other <coughs> theorems, which are much more transcendental and mysterious. Okay. Um, so, having said that, I'm going to state um, our theorem, um, which will either make sense to you or it won't. And the rest of the talk will be explaining what it means and hopefully getting a little bit into the proof. Okay. Um, so. Well, I, I said it about this one, so, okay. So theorem, and this is joint with Richard Webb and Sam Taylor. Um, Taylor, Webb. Uh, well, actually, before I state it, I should state one more theorem. Um, because once I state this other theorem, it's going to be clear. I'm going to state one more theorem, and our theorem is going to be how to obtain effective control on that, okay? So this is the maser minsky projection formula, okay? um, which plays a big role in the proofs of those two previous theorems, not the one that's already has some effective control. Okay? So theorem, maser minsky okay. there exists M1 and M2, both which depend on the surface such that up to, you know, additive and multiplicative errors bounded above by M1, 
by M1, the, uh, the following are equal. Okay? So it's a list of three things. One, two, three. Okay? The first is the length of a hierarchy connecting two pan's decompositions, P1 and P2. Okay? The length, and if this makes sense to you, great. If it doesn't, I'm going to explain it. Of a hierarchy H connecting a pair of pan's decompositions, P1 and P2. The second thing is the distance in the pants graph between P1 and P2. So already, no one, if you don't know what a hierarchy is, it's a quasi GDC in the pants graph <laughs> by the first part of this theorem. Okay? Um, the third thing is the sum over all essential subsurfaces of subsurface projections between P1 and P2, but I throw out all of the surfaces, subsurfaces, that have a projection smaller than this second constant that hasn't played a role yet anywhere in the statement of this theorem. Okay? So this is actually a finite sum um, now that I've had. You choose M2 to make this a finite sum. Okay, so now I need to just define what this means. But before I do that, I want to state our theorem, which says something about how M1 and M2 must grow with, with the complexity of the surface. Okay? <laughs> Yes, thank you, sorry. Uh, why non-annular, thank you. Um, and I also want to say that, that thank, thanks Jason, because I, I, I meant to say, and I forgot, that you can think of this, even if you don't know what it means, as being a theorem about how to use the curve graph to compute distance in the pants graph. That's what two is. So one and three are mysterious objects, if you don't know what they already are, but they're determined by the curve graph. So you're using the curve graph to measure distance in the pants graph. There's a completely similar formulation for, and literally all the words remain the same, but you erase this non-annular thing that Jason said, and you also change P to something else. But the point is, is that you can also do this exact same thing, where the constants might be different, to use the curve graph to measure distance in the mapping class group as well. Okay? So our theorem applies to both of those, the one I'm about to write. Okay? Um, I didn't, want to, I didn't want to talk about that because it's harder to, harder to mention. Okay, so uh, M1 uh, necessarily grows linearly uh, in chi of S. So we have upper and lower bounds that are linear in, excuse me, it should be, it should be M2. Okay? M1, I, wish M2, I wish M1 grows linearly. So M, M, one, M1 grows at least exponentially. At least exponentially, and at worst, factorially. In the order of characters. Okay? Um, so, okay, great. Um, this, is a, this, is, this is the main theorem, and there, and there are some nice corollaries. So one, one corollary, it's not, it's, it's not really a corollary, it's, I'll call this theorem one. But it follows from this. So theorem two is a way to obtain some effective control on Brock's mapping towards scale. Okay? Um, the constants, the, the lower bound in Brock's theorem, so remember, this is the one that bounded the volume of the mapping towards above and below by translation length in the pants graph. Um, the lower bound is the one which bounds the volume from below. Um, grows at worst factorially. So this might look like a really bad bound. Um, but let me mention that after doing a little bit of uh, fudging around with a couple of examples, I don't have a proof, but I, I believe that the sharpest you can do is exponential in complexity. Um, and I should say also that uh, Dave Fooder, Saul Schleimer, and Jessica Purcell are also working on um, proving a theorem like this using totally different methods. They don't do it by trying to effectivize Mazur Minsky. They do it by um, using this Kirchhoff Hodgson machinery of, you know, you, you have some quasi Fuchsian three manifold and you drill out a bunch of curves and you have to somehow estimate when you fill 
back in and you didn't fill, how much volume have you lost somehow? So it's something totally different. Um, and they, the, the, uh, the growth that they get, the bounds that they get on, on these constants look something like Euler characteristic to the Euler characteristic. So it's basically the same as factorial. Okay. Um, so, okay. Now, um, those are the main theorems, and uh, I want to somehow make them make sense to you if they don't already. So, okay, what are these things? So, first of all, subsurface projection. Um, and this will be good, too, because Richard's going to talk next about some really great arguments that will also rely on you knowing what this definition means. So, subsurface projections. On time. Oh, I turned my phone off, so I don't know. I mean, it's about 3 to 10. 3 to 10? Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay. So, um, so what are these? So I take some subsurface <coughs> Y in S, which is non annular, not an annulus, a central subsurface. So, by essential, I mean that the boundary of Y uh, consists of essential simple closed curves in S. Essential simple closed curves in S. So as an example, okay, here's some surface S, and this is Y. Okay? Everything to the left of that curve, that's an example of a subsurface. Okay, great. So there's um, a nice way of defining a map from the curve graph of the entire surface to the curve graph of any subsurface like Y. Okay? Um, so there exists a projection map. So which we'll call pi sub Y, and it goes from the curve graph of S to the curve graph of Y. And how do you define it? So I take some simple closed curve on alpha, and I send it to its intersection with y, and then I put this in quotations, because that's, if you know what this means, then you have no problem with it, and if you don't know what it means, then it's not well defined. I mean, first of all, what if alpha is disjoint? Say again? That makes the power set of the curve graph of y, right? Sure, yeah. It's, it's also the power set of the curve graph of y, exactly. I mean, first of all, alpha need not intersect y, and in that case, the projection is not defined. Okay. So it's not defined for the whole curve complex. It only works if alpha intersects y in some way. Um, so if alpha is contained in y completely, I mean, if this is alpha, then you just send alpha to itself. Okay? If alpha somehow crashes through the boundary of y a bunch of times, then its intersection with y is some multi-arc. Okay? And you define the projection by just picking any one of those arcs and then doing a surgery to make it into a curve. So, as an example, if this is alpha, then this could be its projection to the curve complex of y. So there's obviously many choices that you could have made, but at least coarsely, this is a well-defined map because all the different choices I could have made land me in some uniformly bounded subset, bounded diameter subset of the curve graph of y. And if I'm interested in studying coarse geometry, uh, that's good enough for me. Okay. So this is the projection, the projection map, and I can define what I've written here. This is subsurface per, subsurface distance to just be. So if I have two simple closed curves, alpha and beta then d sub y of alpha beta is just equal to the distance in the curve graph of y between their projections. <coughs> the distance in the curve graph of y between pi y of alpha and pi y of beta. Okay? So that's it. Um, so now, hopefully, the part of this theorem which doesn't talk about bullet point one makes sense there. Everybody in the room, right? How, how does that work for so pets? You have more. You have a bunch. Yes. So great. So, so how does dy? Well, our, yeah, 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 right. Exactly. I mean, already 
even with one curve, its projection to a subsurface is going to be have you know trillions of components. I'm picking one anyway. So I can define this just as well by starting with a pan's decomposition. I pick, sure, I pick one curve in P1. I pick one curve in P2, and I do this for that. Okay? And that will work. Okay? So with this question. Yes. If you made alpha and beta and six and just count the intersections that occurred in Y, would that be relevant to that number? Oh, so not necessarily, um, because um, two curves can you know intersect trillions of times and still only be distance two in any curve graph. So yes. But the other the other direction is true. So uh, the intersection number certainly bounds the distance from above. If you are very far apart in the curve graph, you necessarily intersect many times. Okay. Um, okay, so what this is telling you now is that you can measure the distance in the pants graph just by looking at how your two pants decompositions project to all of the different subsurfaces, and then you compute distance in the curve graph of each of those projections and add all those things up, and that is the distance in the pants graph up to these areas. Okay? So, great. Um, okay, what about bullet point one? Well, I'm not going to define what a hierarchy is. That would be ludicrous. Um, but I'll give you an example. Um, and then I'll let your imaginations do the rest. So as it, it's much easier to talk about what a hierarchy is in low complexity. So let's just assume we're working on a five-fold sphere. Okay? So if uh, S equals S05, so what do we have? Can I draw a pentagon? Yeah. Okay. So here's my five-fold sphere. Okay? And what does a pansy composition look like on a five-fold sphere? It consists of two curves. Okay? And each of those curves has the property that it bounds two punctures on one side and three on the other. Okay? So here's a fancy composition there and there. Okay? So I can call this, this is P1. So P1 is white. And maybe P2 will be something crazier, okay? So I don't know. Come here, and then something else. Horribly bad. Um, Maybe over here, and then, well, I can't do much now. I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've tied myself down. But just imagine that it crosses things a million times, OK? OK? So P1 and P dot. So P2 is an orange. OK? And um, I want to somehow measure the distance between P1 and P2 in the pants graph, OK? So here's what you do. First, so let's call the two curves in P1 something. Let's call them alpha 1 and beta 1. And let's call the curves in P2, say, alpha 2 and beta 2. Okay? So I just look at the alphas. Okay? So I pick alpha 1 and I pick alpha 2. And I just try and see how to connect them in the curve graph first. So here's alpha 1 and here's alpha 2. And I connect them by some geodesic in the curve graph of the whole surface. Okay? This is a geodesic in C of S05. Okay? And let's label these something, I don't know. So let's say V0, V1, V2, V3. Okay? And now note that so okay, so V0 is this joint from alpha 1 and also from, from V1, right? Now alpha 1 and V1 must lie on the same side of V0. Everyone see that? Some confused looks. Really not confused in the front. Confused in the back. Um, so, so the, okay, yeah. So basically the point is just that this is the geodesic. So alpha 1 and V1 have to actually be distance 2 apart in the curve graph. So they must intersect, in particular. So if they lied, if they lied on different halves of the surface from, from V0, they couldn't intersect, because V0 separates. But another way you could do it is we're on a five-fold sphere, and one of the two sides of V0 is a three-fold sphere, and that doesn't support any curves at all. So, okay. So either way, alpha 1 and V1 are contained 
in some four-hole sphere, that's one of the two components um, that you get by cutting along D0. Okay? And what I can do is I can try to connect alpha 1 to V1 together by a geodesic in that four-hole sphere. Okay? So how close are alpha 1 and V1 if I'm not allowed to use basically V0 as the shortcut between them? So first of all, what is the curve graph of a four-hole sphere? By the definition I gave in the beginning, it should be a totally disconnected graph because there does not exist a pair of simple closed curves on a four-hole sphere that are disjoint. But you, do, you, you make a new definition for the four-hole sphere. The curve graph of a four-hole sphere, vertices are the same simple closed curves, edges intersect twice. So I connect two curves by an, by an edge when they intersect twice. Okay? And so now I can connect V0 to V1 by some geodesic in the curve graph of the four-hole sphere that lives in the complement of V0. And it'll look like this. This is just a schematic cartoon. Okay? And I can do the same thing again, but now <coughs> noticing by the exact same argument that V0 and V2 have to be contained in some four-hole sphere in the complement of V1, and so I can do this, I can do this again. And I can keep doing this, keep doing this, okay? And eventually, what I've done is gone from alpha 1 to alpha 2, and note that each of these moves that I've done is basically a, a, a length one move in the pants graph. That's what you do, right? So if I, if I take two pants decompositions, I'm going to replace a curve of one by another one that intersects the replacement curve twice. So all of these are pants moves, and I've just given you a path then in the pants graph from some pants decomposition that contains alpha 1 to one that contains alpha 2. Okay? And this is an example of a hierarchy. Okay? So in general, on larger complexity surfaces, um, you, know, you can keep doing this. Okay? So if this, you know, if this was a, if these didn't, if this wasn't a four-hole sphere, maybe it was a genus 7,000 surface, I can, I can get bumps on bumps on bumps. Okay? I just go up forever. So I, I can do it again for these and, and these and these. You just keep filling in and filling in and filling in, and it looks like this crazy horrible mess. And that's basically what a hierarchy is, okay? So that's, I'll leave it at that. There's a million different technical definitions and axioms that need to be satisfied in order for a theorem like this to be true. But that's what it is, okay? So, um, what, uh, what are those spokes that you're drawing? Are those like edges in the. Uh, uh, so, or like or these or extra things I just drew? No, no, the, when you drew the. Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. So, so, so these, these spokes, so I'm thinking of, so this is a geodesic in the curve graph of the four-hole sphere in the complement of V1. The spokes are just to represent the fact that since they're all disjoint from V1, right. they are connected to an edge so in the full edges. curve graph. Yeah, yeah, those are edges in the full curve okay. graph, yeah. Okay, okay. good. Um, so now hopefully, you know, this really amazing theorem of Mazur and Minsky makes sense to people in the room. Okay. One thing. What's length if you have more bumps? Good. So, um, thank you. Uh, so the length of a hierarchy is just the sum of the lengths of all the geodesics that appear in various curve graphs in the full hierarchy. You add up all the lengths. That's what it is, okay? And so what Mazur and Minsky do in general, not in the five-fold sphere, but in any surface, is they generalize this, this conception of giving you a way of kind of snaking through the hierarchy, and it's much more complicated. It doesn't look like a snake in general. It looks horrible, and they have to give you some kind of way to kind of move through it. And the amazing thing is that even, so this is a path, certainly. It's a path in the pants graph, but their theorem is telling you that the path that you get by ordering this the right way is actually an efficient path in the pants graph. Okay? Um, great. So, um, so now we understand the theorem. I want to talk a little bit about the proof and maybe also how um, understanding the growth of the constants in Brock's theorem follows from a little bit of extra work once you've effectivized the Mazur-Minsky projection formula. Okay. Um, so, right. So maybe um, one thing I'll talk about in this in this in this proof is actually. I'll talk a little bit about, yeah, just so, I can get, just so that I can fit both of them in. I'll talk about the part of the proof that plays no role in Brock's theorem 
and then I'll talk about Brock's theorem. So the part of the proof that couldn't play any role in Brock's theorem is the lower bound that tells you that actually these constants have to grow exponentially. Okay, so um, so how do you, so so how do we do that, right? You have to make some examples. You have to actually construct, say, a hierarchy or you know two pansy compositions having the property that they really break this theorem in an exponential way. Okay, so um, so theorem. Um, so on the sphere with p punctures, there exists pan's decompositions p1 and p2, and a hierarchy h, which I'll call hp, I guess, um, connecting p1 to p2 such that the first is that this hierarchy is long. It's, it's exponentially long in P. So the length of this hierarchy, which again is just the sum of all the different geodesics that pop up in the hierarchy, is at least like 2 to the P. Okay? So it's very big. Um, the second is that if I look at the subsurface projections from P1 to P2, uh, S non-annular distance P1 to P2 and so where is it? What did I call M1? What did I call M2? M2. So the threshold is M2 and this is 0. Okay. So despite the fact that the hierarchy is very, very long, there are no subsurface projections that are big enough to be picked up by the, the sum formula. Okay. Um, so if you think about this for a few minutes, maybe you'll sort of conclude that this is good enough to tell you that the additive error in this formula has to grow exponentially. But it doesn't say that much about the multiplicative error. Okay. So the multiplicative error, there's a, there's a companion theorem, which is just an extension of this, that tells you that you can get a similar hierarchy that has behavior like this, but one for which you know, the, the, the main geodesic, the first one, is as long as you like. And somehow that tells you, so that tells you that you know, this, this exponential error gets propagated over and over again by however long this hierarchy is. And so it's actually true for both the additive and multiplicative errors, that you can make the, expo you can make, the error can be as bad as exponential. And I'm also betting that this is sharp. So the upper bound we have is factorial. And where does this factorial come from? Basically, theoretically, there are two really annoying things that might happen. And the factorial is they'd have to line up. They'd have to happen at the same time for the same hierarchy. And it probably doesn't happen, but I, I don't know. I, I can't prove it. And I don't know. I don't think we can prove it yet. Um, so, but I'd be surprised. That's just, I'm not. So don't hold uh, Richard and Sam liable for that statement. But I don't think it, I don't think it will happen. Um, okay, so um, how does this, how do you construct this, this, this hierarchy? I'll give you a basic idea. Um, um, what's the time look like? Also, someone's phone is here. <laughs> I have 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's by an inductive process, okay? You assume that you have some hierarchy that badly is captured by this formula on a lower complexity surface, and then you try to extend it into the full surface. Okay? So I assume that I can find, say, this hierarchy on S0, P minus 1 sitting inside of S0, P. Okay? So here's, here's S0, P, okay? and here is S0, P minus 1. Okay? And I'm assuming that I have this hierarchy I'm looking for supported on this subsurface, and I want to try and figure out a way to kind of move it, extend it into something that's defined on the whole surface, while at the same time doubling its length, so I get this exponential growth. Okay? Um, so how does... Yeah? What, what's the M2 in this case? Because couldn't you just make M2 smaller? Or? Yeah, yeah, you could, but then the formula doesn't work. So. So you're right. So there, there's another, yeah, you're exactly right. There's another clause to the theorem 
which says that you know th there's a canonical choice of M2, which tells you that if your projection is bigger than M2, then you actually have to show up somewhere in the hierarchy. And the projection to that subsurface is basically equal to the length of the geodesic that's there. So yeah, we, we, we make a choice of M2 in order for that part of the theorem to still remain true. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, OK, so great. What do we do? So if we have the hierarchy on this subsurface, so what does it look like? So um, let's just suppose that the main, the bottom geodesic has length 3, OK? And this is just a cartoon. This is not actually what it looks like, but I'm just going to draw the same cartoon as I drew before. You have these bumps on bumps on bumps doing some crazy thing, living this, all of this consists of curves that are living just on this subsurface, okay? And now, what you can do is, if beta is a curve that bounds two punctures on one of its sides, so it, it cuts off a three-hole sphere, there's gonna be some map of the full surface that sends beta, wherever it lies crazily in this subsurface, to this, this curve here because that's all that matters. Uh, you know, the, the, the topological type of a curve just depends on the number of punctures it bounds on each side. Okay? So let's call this curve V. Okay? And there, if you choose beta such that it also bounds the three-hole sphere somewhere in this picture, say here's beta, then there's going to be some map, let's say phi is some homeomorphism of the full surface, S0P, which interchanges beta and V. So phi of beta is v, and phi of v equals beta. Okay, and so what what happens? So maybe here's v down here. Okay, um, and alpha and beta and everything in this picture are connected to v by edges since v is disjoint from everything happening in this picture. Okay, now v is also equal to phi of beta. So this is phi of beta. And beta is equal to phi of v. Now, phi of alpha is somewhere else. Phi of alpha is out here. But phi of alpha is definitely disjoint from beta. Because beta is phi of v. Phi is a homeomorphism, and v and alpha are disjoint. So there is going to be an edge here. OK? And the goal is to pick this phi in such a way that this new path is actually a geodesic in the full surface, and in such a way that all this craziness that was over here kind of gets reflected over here, and you've doubled the length of the hierarchy, okay? So the name of the game is actually being very careful about this choice, because by a theorem that I only alluded to um, when Matt asked this question, um, if you do this in some, some willy-nilly way, picking any fee, you might accidentally pick up other geodesics in this hierarchy that just pop up. They pop up because you've accrued a large subsurface projection. Um, and we don't want that because basically what we're trying to construct is a hierarchy that's long, but such that all of its geodesics are very short. So if I pick up a really big projection distance to a subsurface when I do this between alpha and phi of alpha, then I might be getting a really, really huge geodesic popping up in some new subsurface that I wasn't even anticipating being there. And that's going to break this whole construction. So you need to pick some kind of a map which, on the one hand, gives you a geodesic here, and on the other, um, has uniformly bounded subsurface projections independent of the complexity. Okay? So, um, right. So that's maybe a, a taste of the difficulties that arose in trying to construct this hierarchy, um, it boiled down, in the end, to doing a lot of estimates. Um, but, I mean, I mean sort of the, the, the kernel of the idea is finding the right map, which um, has this property that um, independent of complexity. So you can, what I'm saying is you can find a sequence of pseudo-nasas, one on each surface, having the property that they all have uniformly bounded projections independent of what surface they're sitting on. Okay? So there's some constant, like a thousand, such that any of these pseudo nasas on any of the surfaces they're sitting on has the property that its axis in the curve graph projects to a diameter less than 1,000 set in any of the subsurface. Okay? So some troubled looks. Is it okay? Okay. 
So that's that's the idea of this construction. So in the remaining, I guess, um, eight minutes, maybe I'll talk a little bit about um, Brock's theorem and, and how to go from from the other inequality, the one that doesn't tell you how bad, but how not bad this is when you throw, can be used to say something about the constants in that theorem. I should also mention that the upper bound in this mapping torus theorem is has been known to be uniform for a while due to, I guess, I think it's in one of Abel's papers. Um, it's a pretty short paper, it's a nice paper. But basically what's happening, um, if you know these words, great. If you don't, then just fall asleep for the next two seconds. But what he's basically doing is constructing a Minsky model for, you know, for this mapping torus. And um, so you know, you, you have like a, 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 an ideal right angled hyperbolic octahedra for every move in this hierarchy. And so the, the constant that pops up is the volume of one of those octahedra. So it's, that's what it is. But the lower bound is always what's harder. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, OK, so how does Brock's argument actually work? Um, the first sort of idea that you need um, is this fact that the volume of one of these manifolds is coarsely the same as the number of short curves. Okay, Because every short curve has to have some long tube. Um, so the number of short curves has to drive up the volume. Okay, So volume um, bounded below by the number of short geodesics. Okay? So um, there's another version of this theorem of Brock, which I haven't been stating. It's a, it's a sort of this, this convex core version of the theorem, where instead of um, having a mapping torus, I can take a quasi Fuchsian 3 manifold. Okay? It's determined by the two conformal boundary uh, points in Teichmuller space. And this theorem says that there are constants such that the volume of the convex core up to these additive and multiplicative constants is the same as the distance between those two points in Teichmuller space in the Bay peterson metric. Okay? Um, and in the same paper, he shows that the Bay peterson metric is QI to the pants graph. So I can also say that you know, um, the volume of the convex core of a quasi fuchsian 3 manifold is coarsely the same as the distance in the pants graph between a short pants decomposition on one boundary component and a short pants decomposition on the other. OK? Make sense? OK. So this is the first sort of part of it. The second part is, um, so what does he do? So what Brock does is he. Um, simplicially interpolates um, the convex core of a QF3 manifold. So in other words, he considers these maps of simplicial hyperbolic surfaces starting at one convex core boundary component and kind of moving up to the other. Okay? And so realizing the short pants decompositions that show up along the way. Okay? So um, i.e. So, so mapping uh, in simplicial hyperbolic surfaces uh, to go from one convex core boundary component to another. Okay? And so what does this look like? What this looks like is you have, you have here's, your, here's your lower, here's your, your, your one boundary component of the convex core, and here's the other. And somehow you have these simplicial hyperbolic sort of slices as you move up. And you can ask which pants decomposition is shortest you know, at time t equals 0, and then at time t equals epsilon. And then you, you just ask which is the shortest pants decomposition, and at some point it switches to some new pants decomposition. And on that time slice, you have two pants decompositions which are simultaneously short on the same hyperbolic surface. So they can't be too far apart in the pants here because of the, of the color level. I mean, they, they can't intersect too many times or else one would, one would be long. Okay? 
Okay, so you have a bound on intersection number, so you get a bound on transistors. So you get, you basically build a path in the pants graph realized by this simplicial interpolation, and the path is going to have bounded jumps. Because as I switch from one to the other, I can't move too far in the pants graph. And then, great. So then there's, uh, that's sort of the hyperbolic geometry part of the argument. And then it passes over to the combinatorics. So from there, you have to have some sort of argument that tells you how far apart a pair of pants decompositions can be in the pants graph if they are connected by a path that makes bounded jumps. But you want, you want obviously, by the triangle inequality, you have some bound. But you want the bound to be in terms of the number of curves that show up in this pants path, because that's how we bound volume. And to do that, um, you have to use all of the hierarchy machinery of Mazur and Minsky, and that's basically the only part that um, really needs to be effectivized to, to finish off this theorem. And so you plug in some of our results, um, and you get what you're looking for. So um, that's a really sketchy sketch, but um, that's OK. I guess I will stop here.